Good afternoon and welcome to the first in our three-part Made by McGill alumni webcast series as we explore the many ways in which our world and our lives have been upended by the coronavirus pandemic and hear from some of our leading McGill experts about how we ought to prepare for these unprecedented changes. My name is Derek Kassoff, Managing Director of Communications at McGill's Office of University Advancement, and it's Thursday, August 19th. We begin our series today in the company of two McGill professors who will help us understand how the pandemic has impacted the future of work. Has the pandemic changed the way employers and employees view office work? Will organizations permit their staff to continue the work from home when fears of the virus subside? And how will employees cope with the sudden transition back to a Monday to Friday, nine to five routine after having spent the last 18 months hunkered down in their homes? Let me introduce our two guests. Professor Lisa Cohen is an associate professor in organizational behavior and the Director of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at McGill's Deseltel Faculty of Management, where her teaching and research focuses on human resources, talent management, and the sociology of work. Welcome, Professor Cohen. Thanks for having me. And Richard Kessner is a professor in the Department of Psychology and Director of the McGill Human Motivation Lab, which seeks to understand how individuals determine which goals matter to them and how they motivate themselves to pursue those goals. Welcome, Professor Kessner, and thank you as well for joining us today for what I think will be a fascinating discussion. You're welcome. Now, for those of you who may have tuned into some of our previous webcasts during the pandemic, you may not recognize the background behind me. I am, in fact, back in my work office today, which is fitting given today's topic. And before we jump into it, just a reminder that if you are watching live and have any questions for our panelists, you can send them to us via email to aoc at mcgill.ca, and we'll do our best to address them to our guests. So let's begin with a question for you, Professor Cohen. Uh, maybe I'll sort of set the stage a little bit. So during the pandemic, uh, as you know, many office workers who may have never before considered working from home suddenly found themselves working full time from their kitchens and bedrooms and basements and making use of new technologies like video conferencing to connect with colleagues and virtual private networks or VPNs to access their files remotely. When the pandemic finally comes to an end, do you expect everyone to gradually or even suddenly return to their offices as before? Or do you think the pandemic has spawned a sort of great rethink about where and perhaps even when so-called office work should take place? Thanks, great question. I, I think a lot about these questions and about rethinking work, um, how we should be doing work, when we should be doing it, where. And this great experiment in working from home that COVID put in front of us is one piece of it. But there are lots of things that are driving us to think more about work, uh, to rethink the conditions. So a big one is technology, artificial intelligence, other smart technologies, issues around sustainability, uh, the changing demography of the world. So work from home and, and COVID is just one, one important piece of that. Uh, we need to think about what people do, who they do it with, how we reward them, both in terms of money um, and psychic rewards, which I think Richard will be able to speak much more to, um, when they do it, and, and what kind of meanings it has for you. So with that said, I think I would say I hope that we don't reflexively just return to work. I hope that we do it in a thoughtful, careful yeah. way and that we have actually learned from, from this, this um, great experiment. Uh, there are a few issues that I see being raised. Uh, if I go more specifically to the question you asked about uh, issues that introduced here and what we need to think about. Um, one of those big questions is around fairness or across this new divide. Who is it that gets to take advantage of these new work arrangements? Uh, I, I recently saw something really disturbing about some companies that are putting in place work from home policies that people are going to pay be paid differently depending on where yeah. they live. So if I live in New York city, I get paid more than my colleague who does exactly the same work in Stanford. And, and I see this as deeply disturbing. Um, it doesn't make sense. It, it's kind of a regressive uh, practice. If you can't afford to live in New York, you get paid less and you never can afford to live in New York. Other issues we need to think about here, um, the three big ones are culture, 
Um, how is this shifting our culture? Do we want to keep it this way? Uh, going back, however we go back, gives us um, managers a, a real opportunity to build their culture from the ground up. It's like starting again, uh, huge issues about how you coordinate no matter where you are working, and then issues around how you build and maintain relationships. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you brought up some of the sort of issues that I think we're going to discuss with our, our psychologist, uh, Professor Kester, in a minute. Um, and I have a, a few questions around that. But let me just follow up with you, Professor Cohen. I mean, so you, you sort of talked about the fact that what I sort of took from that is there's a lot of uncertainty right now. It seems like, um, at least for the, in the interim period this fall, there's a lot of discussion about what we're calling the hybrid model. Yeah. So this idea that employees would divide their work weeks between their homes and their offices, whether it's two days a week at home and three in the office or vice versa or whatnot. Um, or, you know, even greater levels of flexibility. I guess my question, someone like you who's sort of studied this and is trained in this, can a hybrid model like this work in the long term? I mean, let's bring up so many issues. And, and I'm wondering what advice you can offer employees yeah. and employers who are embarking on a, a transition like this. Yeah, so we've already talked about those issues of fairness, coordination, culture mm -hmm. relationships. Uh, I do think it can work, but I also think there's a lot of advice that, that people need around this. And it's three groups of people who need advice. Um, some of you in the audience are employers or managers, so I have some advice for you. I'm willing to wager that almost all of you are employees uh, and, and will be directly affected by this. And I also think we need to think about some of the issues here in policy arenas as well. So in terms of employers, I want to urge you not to just create a blanket policy to cover each all jobs. Each job and each job incumbent is distinct and there will be distinct reasons for choices around working at home and in, in the office. Around this, I want to urge people to actually ask your employers what they want and why they want it and what they think will work. Um, some really basic things provide people with the tools they need. If they need a, a laptop, make sure they have it. Actively coordinate um, formal and informal interactions, think deliberately about culture, do not differentiate between at home and in office employees, uh, and occasionally bring people together. In terms of employees, I would give the advice to uh, consistently demonstrate that, that the arrangements you want, whether they're at home or office, to demonstrate their that these work um, by doing your best work wherever you are. Don't treat your colleagues differently. The, um, in past experiments with work from home, there were issues where uh, the colleagues in the office didn't want to disturb the colleagues at home, but they were at work. And, and we all need to be conscious of that going forward. It's not disturbing them to ask them to do their job. Um, understand why you want to do things, be clear about what you want to do. And, and um, I said, ask your employees about what they want, but also ask your managers, what are they trying to, to figure out and accomplish here? And I'm really quick when I talk about policymakers because that's not my thing. I think can think of off the top of my head four arenas that they need to think about. Childcare is one of them, transportation system, taxes. So how do you, how do you uh, account for people using their home offices in taxes and questions that that go to training and and redeployment. Wow, wow. So you've given us quite a lot to think about and to try to unpack and we'll try to get through some of the, some of the more specific questions in, in the uh, time we have today. Um, but thank you for that wonderful sort of introduction for setting the scene of all the, the challenges uh, and the complexity of this issue. Let me actually turn to Professor Kester now and bring you into this conversation. Um, I imagine that any transition back to a traditional workplace is going to have a tremendous impact on, on the mental health and stress of employees. Uh, in fact, I've heard friends and colleagues describing to me their imminent return to the office as a form of PTSD or post-traumatic yeah. stress disorder, which I know is often associated with survivors of natural disasters or soldiers returning from war. So I guess my question to you is, is, is this an accurate comparison? And what can one do to cope with the shock to the system that is going to come 
the first time you have to, you know, put on decent looking pants and trudge back yeah. into the office. Yes, I, I, uh, that's a great question. I think many of us are struggling with exactly this question. And uh, what I would say first is, I think most of us are probably feeling anxious and maybe a little discouraged too. I thought we would be done with the pandemic once we got all the vaccines, but now there's a fourth wave. And my guess is you've been receiving kind of inconsistent information about what work will be like. So here at McGill, I teach a class with 500 students. And in May, they told me, oh, it's all going to be online. And then in July, I checked my teaching schedule and I'm in the biggest teaching hall there is, and it was going to be in person. And then two days later, I found it's not. So there's been inconsistency. Now, I have a really interesting perspective on this, I think, because I have a 20-year-old daughter who's about to start at McGill University. I take her to the new res tomorrow, and she's going to move in. And she's nervous, and she's anxious. But I feel like I have to present this front of someone who is confident, everything's going to work out fine. Meanwhile, I'm really nervous about going back to work too. And um, mm -hmm. the secret, I think for many of us, and it's kind of an embarrassing secret, is we've gotten used to working at home. And, you know, if you're a little more introverted rather than extroverted, you may actually be liking it <laughs> and liking it a whole lot. And it seems wrong to like have benefited from the pandemic and, and all of these changes. But I, th I think it's good to be honest with yourself and acknowledge that, you know, we, we feel ambivalence. That's the human condition. And there is a high level of anxiety. And at McGill University, if any of you have come for homecoming, the biggest change from when you were students is anxiety levels are much higher. The, the students at, at our university are much more anxious about everything than you used to be. And then they have the pandemic also. So how do we manage anxiety? I think it begins with kind of acknowledging how you're feeling, talking to some other people, and then doing some personal you know, experiments to see if you could expose yourself to what you're scared of. So I've started going into the office a couple days a week. Some of my colleagues have been in for a while longer. Some are really resisting. <laughs> I've really been surprised. Two of my female colleagues who are remarkably socially skilled and extroverted, they're really scared about going in because they feel they may have lost the ability to have small talk <laughs> and to engage in like regular conversations. And these are two remarkably socially skilled people. It's just that what we've gone through for the last two years is unlike anything that's ever happened. So it's, mm -hmm. it's natural to feel uncertain. And I think it's a matter of acknowledging that and thinking of some ways to kind of reassure yourself. I, I also think this idea of being kind to yourself. And, and the bottom line for me is that there's this saying 90% of life is just showing up. If I just get myself into work in two weeks, <laughs> and if I do it three days, that's going to be a success. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and I'm not going to evaluate myself so much on how I do the first week or the first two weeks. It's, it's going to be hard. Right, right. So if my boss is watching live right now, I hope he'll notice that I'm, I'm in the office. It's my, not my 90%. <laughs> I've, I've done most of the work. Today. No, exactly. Um, <laughs> uh, we should have minimal yeah. goals. Yes, Professor Cohen, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I, I just wanted to um, reiterate what Richard just said. I'm going into the office this afternoon and I'm a little scared about it. So I'm gonna take, I'm actually will be applying Richard's advice as I, as I had in. Uh, I also am aware of colleagues who teach who are unsure that they'll remember how to teach in a yeah. live classroom. Like, how do you interact with people? Yes. What do you do when you don't have all these screens to help you out? Mm -hmm. So that, that's going to be a huge challenge mm -hmm. there. Well, if, if, we're, if we're being honest here in this call, I've started to come back in the office you know, once a week for the last couple of weeks. And last week, I went out for a cup of coffee uh, during a break. And 
got lost coming back to the office. <laughs> <laughs> We're in a shopping mall complex and I ended up on the wrong floor and it took me a few seconds to realize yes. where I was and how to actually yeah. find the door to the office tower. So yeah. Um, yeah, so let me just stick with you, Professor Kester, for a minute. I know you've actually given talks to employees here at McGill about sort of the need to redesign our work lives. I think you referred to it as need crafting. So I'm curious if you can maybe explain a little bit more about, you know, yeah. what goes into managing this transition and should we approach it like many of us approach a new year when we, you know, set new year, you know, new goals and, and make new year's resolutions? Yes. So uh, I have spoken to groups and usually I talk about setting goals and I, I do that because I think that's how we motivate ourselves and that's how we feel like we're achieving more in our life. But there's another focus, which I think is more important right now because we've been through such a difficult time. And that is to focus on our basic psychological needs. So I work with a theory called self-determination theory. It's well-developed, a lot of empirical support. And it would argue that, you know, it's, it's not that hard to figure out how we're doing at work, how we're doing in our career, how we're doing in our marriage. We really have to look at kind of the fundamental things that people need to thrive. And there's only three, three really critical things or three most important. The first is to feel autonomous, to feel like you're an author in your own life, that you have input and that you're deciding, you know, how to work, what to work on. So, that's number one, is to feel a sense of autonomy. And our lives have been so disrupted and we've been stuck at home, so we haven't been free like we wish we could be. Okay, the second thing is relatedness. And that means that there's people you care about and who care about you. So it's autonomy, relatedness. And the third thing is competence, to feel like you're doing something that matters and you're doing it well. You don't have to be perfect. You don't even have to be in the top 50%. The key is to feel like you could learn and grow. So it's autonomy, relatedness, and competence. And that spells the acronym ARC. And what I've suggested and the theory suggests is that the ARC of our career, the ARC of our relationships, the ARC of our life is determined by whether we experience autonomy, relatedness, and competence. Now at work, unfortunately, we don't always experience that. If you get a new manager who's very demanding, who doesn't see your point of view, if you're working in healthcare right now where they're expecting unbelievable uh, numbers of things done in a short time and they keep cutting staff, it's very hard to feel competent autonomy and it's even hard to feel connected to, to the others. So there's a new idea and it's called job crafting or need crafting. And here the idea is to, as much as you can, play an active role in structuring what your work life is like. So one of the things I learned a couple of years ago is I work really well at a coffee shop. <laughs> so if I'm reading an article, writing something, I do a, I'm more focused, more interested. And, and then I heard that some people refer to the coffee shop as a coffee's, where instead of working at your office, you're so, you know, even before the pandemic, I was working, you know, a couple hours a day at the coffee shop. Uh, as a professor, a lot of my work is, uh, uh, it's something that I, I have a choice about. And, uh, my problem is that I often say yes to too many things and then I'm doing some stuff that I don't like at all. So a challenge for me is to be more thoughtful about which committees I want to be on, which things I say yes to. So mm -hmm. I, I have to try to be more uh, choiceful and agentic and autonomous. Uh, the final example I'll give, it turns out my two best friends are work colleagues. And that's something I've missed for the last two years. Many of us the people we know the best, we know the deepest are our work colleagues. And even though they're my two best friends, I play golf with them when we can, I never have lunch with them because I like to get the New York Times and read my newspaper. But if I want to craft a need satisfying work environment, I, I should build in some of that, especially after what we've been through. Mm -hmm. So uh, autonomy, relatedness, competence. I think all of us have learned new tricks, new strategies, new ways of working in these last two years. And 
we should see whether we could keep some of them or, mm-hmm. or change them slightly and continue with them while, while we go back to work. Okay, great, very good advice. Professor Cohen, I had a follow-up question for you, but I see you had your hand up first. Yeah. I'll let you jump in now. I just wanted to, um, to add to what Richard said. I was so happy to hear him talk about job crafting along with the needs crafting, because it's important to pay attention to how what people actually do every day changes and and to emphasize that COVID hasn't just changed where we work, it's changed what we do, right? I didn't do this sort of thing pre-COVID. It's a new task. Uh, There are some other tasks that that went away and and there, there is some shifting of those tasks that we need to pay attention to. Not all of that is self-driven. Some of it may be managerial driven uh, to help us assemble our tasks, assemble our jobs together, but, but it's not just the needs, it's what you do, and mm-hmm. that helps satisfy those needs. Right. Yeah. Very interesting. So that sort of leads to my next question. And I know uh, Professor Kester mentioned the notion of autonomy and, and you, Professor Cohen, just talked about, you know, how much of that is employee driven versus managerial driven. So, I mean, I suppose fundamentally, the central question I'm thinking of is who is ultimately going to get to decide these questions? You know, where work takes place, when, how is it, you know, at the end of the day, going to be the CEOs and managers and HR executives who are going to decide to go along with a more flexible approach or not? Or do employees have any influence in the situation to sort of, as as Professor Kessler said, craft their own situations where the work gets done, but more on their terms? Yeah, um, that's, that's an important question. And I think about it this way. A CEO, a manager, an HR executive, they may have the right to decide, but if they're any good at their job, they're not going to do it in a vacuum. They're going to pay attention to what their employees want and what they do. So kind of co-determination in in this. Uh, We did a series of uh, focus groups or town halls with our employees and and learned that indeed it's not one way that that people really wanted very different things and had very different experiences with COVID. And it's up to those managers to learn about that and to to use it within their, their responses. Mm -hmm. So I do have a follow up question on that point. But let me just remind our audience, if you are watching live and you have any questions for either of our our panelists, you can send them to us at aoc at mcgill.ca. So I guess getting back to this this notion, uh, Professor Cohen, about, you know, I guess employers listening, paying attention. um, Do you think that organizations that, you know, come out of the pandemic offering more flexibility to their employees are going to ultimately be able to track and retain top talent? Is that going to become a big factor for where employees choose to work? Right. Super important right now because I keep hearing about tight labor markets. That's what the Mm -hmm. statistics are saying. That's what the signs in the windows around me are are saying. I also know that people who lost their jobs are are going back to, to work, but I also know that now that there are more opportunities, people may be able to leave work. So that seems to put employees in, in a strong position here. Um, whether whether um, being flexible to them is an advantage or not, I'm not I'm not convinced on that. Um, is it flexibility or is it being able to match what you offer? with what your employees want. Yeah. So, so there, are, there is diversity in what people want. Some people want to be in the office. Some people want to be at home. Some want a mix. Know what your employees want and match that. Use that those ideas when you're selecting people into your organization. If you're a stay-at-home organization, make sure you select people who, who also want to, to stay home. So, it doesn't, I think matching it, getting it right is what provides the, the advantage. There's not one way that's better or worse. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So Professor Kesten, to turn back to you, I mean, I know during the pandemic, you know, many of us were essentially forced to turn our living quarters into workspaces. And as you suggested, you know, for some of us, that was very convenient. Um, but it also may have led to higher levels of mental stress and burnout. And I've heard from a lot of people who said they didn't feel like 
they were so much working from home as sometimes they were living in the office. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if this is something you've noticed during the pandemic. And, and do you think that this opportunity to return to the office, you know, this fall uh, and, and offer people a more normal routine where you have a separation between home and workspaces, yes. is that actually perhaps a salvo that many of us need to regain yeah. our equilibrium, equilibrium and motivation? And, and sure. I think you're exactly right there. And, uh, I'll be honest, I need that. I, I've lost the balance in my life. I, I've loved working at home. And uh, at first, I just talked about commuting. Oh, my gosh, I don't have to commute anymore. I don't have to get in the metro in the winter with my heavy jacket. And then it's so hot. And I thought, this is the good life. No commuting. And then I read an article in the New York Times, which says commuting serves a vital function in creating a boundary between work and home. And that uh, they've actually done studies where when you're in your car commuting to work, there's a gradual change in what you're thinking about and how you're feeling and how you're motivated. And I don't think I knew that. I don't think most of us knew that. And uh, the idea is that because there's no more commuting and because there's no more distinction between going to work and being at home, we've somehow fallen into a trap of just working longer days, of losing track of weekdays versus weekends. I work seven days. I work 7 a.m. till 11 p.m., not continuously. I've become a workaholic for the first time in my life. I'm a pretty relaxed <laughs> well-centered person. But I was also consulting with the human resource managers at the English speaking school boards in Quebec. And we did it from last August all the way until June. And the funny thing is that managers and knowledge workers, at first it seemed we were all doing okay. We were lucky to be able to continue our working. We had to learn Zoom, but once we learned it, we thought, this is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> but around January, February, a lot of the managers I was working with were beginning to feel fatigue and beginning to feel burnout. So there was a delayed impact where I think most of us realized that our work life was out of order. Now, it doesn't mean we have to go to our office. And in fact, there are work consultants who would say, there's small things you can do. Like you should never go right from the kitchen or your bed to your office. You should walk around the block and then come in. Uh, when you go into your office, you should put on a jacket like Derek's wearing there. So it looks like a work jacket. Uh, you shouldn't be wearing shorts like I'm wearing <laughs> because I like to be comfortable. And then at five o'clock, they say you should get a shroud and put it over your laptop or computer. So you're like burying your computer and the day is over. And we, we need that. Now, I, I don't want to go so far because I've always liked being a professor because I could take off a, a, in the middle of the day and I could work on the weekend. I like that flexibility. But in the last two years, I've really, I, I've lost my capacity <laughs> to stop working. I think going back into the office could get me back on that. Uh, I, I don't know how others feel, but I, I think that's our challenge to find the right balance and to feel like we can actually control it and that we're not like in this uncontrollable thing where we're just working all the time. Yeah. So yeah. Professor Cohen, as the business professor, is, is this resonating with you, what uh, Professor uh, Kessner is speaking of? Yeah, it's resonating with my life and with my, <laughs> my research. It's, it's real. Uh, and I think I wanted to add something. Um, what Richard was saying almost blamed Richard for what he was doing. It's my fault. I became a, a workaholic. But the other thing that's happening is that the, the pandemic has made a lot of things much more difficult. It yeah. takes more time. How many times did I rework my syllabus 
from online to in-person to hybrid to it, it just takes time. My, my co-authors, my collaborators aren't available the way they, they were. Uh, coordinating meetings is harder. So, so there's a reason that, that work is, is bleeding um, on. And indeed, I think um, the best piece of advice I got, which unfortunately I don't always follow, is to, to start each day and end each day with with a, a real walk, a considerable yeah. walk. I used to walk 40 minutes to work every day, and I do miss that. So yeah. try to recreate it. Yeah. Yeah, great. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Though. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say one other thing about becoming a workaholic, because I think Lisa did pick up accurately the way I was feeling. But I think it also served a, a defensive function. And the pandemic's been hard and it's been scary. And if you have interesting work, and if there's people, I work with a lot of students, so there's a generative aspect to my work. And uh, I think it's a, been a way to kind of make myself feel more useful and to get through this pandemic. And I was actually doing some community work too with the black community that's been devastated by the pandemic. But one thing we did was that early in the pandemic, the Black Lives Matters movement came and we focused on young adults. And what we actually found was that the Black Lives Matters movement allowed a lot of young adults to get out emotionally and psychologically from the worst part of the pandemic because they connected with friends, they got involved in something that was important and uh, personally relevant. And we actually looked at whether people were more obsessive or more relaxed in their participation in the Black Lives Matters movement. And this was the one time where we found that being obsessive was actually helpful and healthy. Usually it's better to be more balanced and harmonious. But I think in the context of a once in a century pandemic that impacts so many people and makes you scared of even looking at the news, uh, having something to be obsessed about was a good coping device. Mm -hmm. And but but always the thing is to realize, okay, I don't have to keep doing that now. <laughs> well, first to realize that I've been doing it, but then to also say, okay, I could stop being rich, <laughs> the workaholic that I've never been before, and I could become rich, the balanced person again, and then to think about how to craft my work and craft my relationship so I can do that. Right, right. Interesting. Very interesting. So again, just a reminder for anyone watching live, if you have any questions, you can send them to us at aoc at mcgill.ca, and we'll try to save some time at the end to address them to our panelists. Uh, Professor Cohen, let me just go back to you. Uh, I want to just address with you the, the notion of um, sort of where people are in the age spectrum and how that might impact their eagerness to want to return to the office. So yeah. I, I guess I'm wondering when, when, when I was sort of confronting this, uh, you know, with my own staff, I'd initially assume that, you know, it would be the younger employees would be the ones that would be, you know, pushing for more flexibility and a greater work-life balance. Uh, yet I was surprised that in my conversations with staff, it, it almost feels like the reverse, that the younger employees are the ones that seem most eager to want to come back to the office um, quicker. So I guess my question is, is that surprising? And what happens if we end up in a situation where all the young, you know, eager employees who want to come back and be surrounded by, you know, mentors and guides come back to an office and all the older folks kind of just want to stay home and work from home? Right. I'm not sure we completely know yet whether this breaks down along along age lines. Uh, I'm not really surprised what what I find a what is I really expected that you referred to is that there is diversity in what people want. I think you would see that within age groups. Um, maybe the young people you work with are particularly social and so need need to build those relationships or need to connect with people for guidance and mentorship more than than others in in other working situations. So um, it does all go back to some of the challenges uh, that we pointed out earlier, especially the ones around building relationships. I can't imagine starting work in this situation. Yeah. How do you kick off a, and maintain a mentoring relationship when you never get to, to meet the, the person in person? So mm -hmm. yeah, um, right. 
Yeah. <laughs> Right. So we are getting a few questions coming in from alumni, which is great. Uh, before we turn to those, let me just have, I guess, another follow-up question to you, Professor Cohen. You talked about sort of the, the sort of challenges around, you know, new employees starting and whatnot. I, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on like, you know, some of these really radical work models that some analysts are talking about, um, you know, sort of notion of like really remote work whereby organizations would allow staff to perform their duties from anywhere on the planet. If you want to go <laughs> park yourself on a beach in Hawaii under a hammock and put in your eight hour workday, that's fine. Um, and I'm wondering, because I know at the start of the pandemic, we read lots of stories about office workers who were fleeing you know, crowded and expensive places like Manhattan or Silicon Valley, relocating to suburbs and rural areas, looking for you know, cheaper housing, fewer fears of the virus. So I'm wondering, is this a realistic long-term model for running a business or an organization? And, and how do you establish and maintain, you know, corporate culture and collaboration when your workforce is potentially scattered all over the world in different time zones? Yeah. So uh, coordinating across time zones is not the hardest challenge we've faced in the last couple of years. I think, <laughs> I think we can we can do that. Uh, I think that if an organization decides on remote work, then there's no reason everyone has to be in a three mile radius. It's okay for people to be further away as long as they're available at the times they need to be available, which might not uh, coincide with the clock where they're, where they're living. I think some of the things we need to think about though, when, when we have remote work is there is a need to sometimes bring people together. And so you would need to bring the person back all the way from Hawaii so you can have that one all hands meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So let's um, start with a question that, that has come in while we've been on air. Uh, this one comes from James Cox. Thank you, Mr. Cox, for the question. Uh, I guess I'll address it to you, Professor Cohen. And if you want to jump in, Professor Kessner, afterwards, uh, you can. He's wondering if there are any unique concerns around public sector employees and managers with regards to this notion of telework, that often there's a public perception that telework by those in the public sector are not good for taxpayers. How do you address those concerns? Telework is not good for taxpayers? I guess then, this would imply right. that they're not being productive. Right. <laughs> so they're, 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 yeah, okay. It, it took a second to, to actually right. for it to set in. Uh, I... I so um, people often use physical presence as a substitute for for monitoring or being not even monitoring, but for for managing people's productivity, what they do. I would argue that if that is the main way you manage people's productivity, you have a much larger problem. I, uh, a manager needs to actually manage performance, create a system where they understand what performance means and a way to understand whether people are performing. I think people were shocked at how productive people ended up being yeah. in, in this situation. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, all right. Well, thank you, um, Mr. Cox, for that question. Uh, we have a couple more coming in. And I actually was going to ask you uh, afterwards, Professor Cohen, about the whole notion of absenteeism and presenteeism. I think you've addressed that is that, you know, I guess managers need to judge their employees and their staff based on the work they produce, not the amount of hours they're physically in an office. And I guess that could potentially present a problem if you don't recognize it, that you don't want to set a setup where employees who just show up in the presence of their boss, for instance, get rewarded and those who do productive work from home um you know maybe are passed over for raises and promotions i see professor kesser you have you have your hand up you want to jump in yes on uh, in preparation for this i i listened to a podcast about a new book called human work it's by jamie marisotis and the focus was on you know partly wrestling with this issue of oh my gosh robots and ai can take over much of what we do and even like all of my lectures this last year, I packaged them and put them online, but a book company could get an even better professor and package all the lectures and I will be out of a job. But uh, one of the things uh, that he focused on is what's special about humans. And that's the empathy, the nuance, the complexity, the relationships. And uh, there's certain things that, we can do. And for some of us, we might do it better 
online, some of us in person, usually there's a mixture of the two. But in terms of a company or a manager, I think something that's really important is you want your workers to grow, to develop skills, that that's the competitive edge that most organizations need. I'm guessing that almost all of your listeners today are knowledge workers, where knowing things and learning how to increase your knowledge is a big part of it. And what I would like to go back to is that when people feel autonomous, related, and competent, they are highly motivated, and they're motivated to grow and learn new things. And most often, they really care about the mission of the organization. And they care about their colleagues, and they want to contribute to both of those. So the bottom line for most companies is how how is the mission of this university or, or company being accomplished? And I think when you have uh, working conditions that are flexible enough to adapt to the individual differences and to make sure that everyone is is feeling autonomous, competent, and connected, that's what's going to lead to good organizational outcomes and good personal mm-hmm. outcomes. Mm-hmm. So, Professor Cohen, let me turn the next question to you. Uh, this is actually something I'd come up with, and I think you'll like this question. Um, so when I was doing a bit of research ahead of this, this webcast, I came across a very interesting, um, I guess, note from John Maynard Keynes, who was a noted economist uh, from the last century. Um, so it, it's interesting. In 1930, he predicted that by the year 2030, we would need to work only about 15 hours a week because technology would have taken over and done the rest for us. Now, we're only eight years away from that moment, and it seems very unrealistic. So I guess my question to you is, what happened? Why was he so off the mark? And and when we talked a bit about this ahead of today, you sort of said it may not be completely off the mark because of the emergence of AI. So maybe you can just address that for us. And how does the whole robots, AI, work, you know, time we spend on work, how does that all intersect? Yeah, and this also intersects with a big conversation that's going on right now about moving toward a four-day work week um, yeah. from a five-day mm-hmm. work week. And the the um, what Keynes said in 1930 uh, has been echoed um, during the Depression. People really tried to spread the work around to more yeah. people, so everybody would have work. Richard Nixon said the same thing a quarter century later. I've read lots of predictions of the end of jobs, the end of work, and it doesn't end. It shifts. Um, And by the way, uh, back in the 1800s, when we instituted the five-day work week, that was radical. People were working 60 to 70 hours a week. So 40 was like this amazing thing, and yet we're we're miserable about it these (laughs) these days. Uh, I think what AI does is it gets rid of some tasks, some of those are boring mundane tasks, not all of them. It also creates new tasks. Somebody has to manage that AI. Uh, I think we've made predictions. I've been watching these ebb and flow. Um, At one point it was billions of jobs are gonna be done away with too. Billions of jobs are going to be affected by AI too. Well, some tasks and some jobs are going to are going to change and Mm -hmm. and be reassembled for people. Okay, great. So go ahead, Professor Kessler. I just want to say the other thing I picked up in this this podcast I was listening to is there's there's different kinds of jobs. And there's one which is showing incredible growth during the pandemic. It's helpers. It's like therapists, counselors, things of that sort. And I was Mm -hmm. trained as a clinical psychologist. I haven't practiced in a long time. But oh, my gosh, business is booming for our recent graduates. Uh, There's something Mm -hmm. about... Uh, being able to do counseling and therapy online that opens it up to many more people. Uh, My sister's a nurse practitioner. She says teenagers are talking and scheduling with her more than they ever have because they could do it from their own, you know, bedroom where they Mm -hmm. feel safe and comfortable. So if we always have to realize that there are different kinds of jobs, there's like the creative jobs, which I think we feel Mm -hmm. we're in, but then there's also a lot of helping jobs, which can be creative too. And Mm -hmm. uh, this, this transition to online work can really open up uh, and and not as many people who could benefit from help are getting help. And it may be that the online 
services are reaching more people and will be really useful in that way. Right, right, right. Well, it's interesting. I had the chance to speak with a uh, noted McGill graduate, Steven Pinker, about a year ago. Yeah. And I'd asked him if he could, you know, what would the world have been like, the world of work, just the, our entire world in a pandemic, had we not had access to all these online technologies? And he said something to the effect, of, I wouldn't even want to think about that yeah. question. So, no, it's so true. We'll, we'll put that aside for maybe yeah. another time. Yeah. So let me turn to some of the questions that have come in, some more questions. I'll start with you, Professor Cohen. We, we sort of just touched on a little bit of this in your previous answer, but um, let me just read you. This comes to us from Victor Barbaros. So he says, we talk about people who are lucky enough to be in industries where working from home or hybrid environments are possible. How would you see the future of jobs that cannot be done working from home? Would there be a tendency to redefine them, perhaps automate them? Or is it a whole different uh, set of issues with those kinds of jobs? Yeah. And I'd like to go back to something that Richard said, which is different jobs are different. So yeah. uh, I think some of them, they could, parts of them could be automated. Yeah. Ultimately, there are going to be jobs where people have to physically be there. I, I think that that yeah. is a reality. Um, not every job is a knowledge job and we need to be aware of that and, and of the differing arrangements that, that would, mm -hmm. would go with that. I think for the most part, when we're talking here today, we are talking about knowledge intensive jobs. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Um, okay, great answer. Uh, Professor Kestner, I'll turn the next one to you. This one comes to us from Margaret Rudolph. She's writing, how, does, how has the constant screen work over the last year affected your brain? I'm not sure she means your brain. <laughs> yes. I assume she means collectively our brains. Yes, um, yes. Have you done any work into that or read up any of uh, about uh, that? Yes. <laughs> well, a lot of it focuses on Zoom fatigue and Zoom stress. And there's certain nonverbal cues that we don't pick up very easily. And even with doing therapy or counseling, there's some nuances that we might miss and there's a hesitation. And the screen I'm looking at now has three of us and to have three faces, actually to see yourself, <laughs> for some of us, that's disturbing. <laughs> so, so just to be so aware of how you look all day. So I think uh, we're still figuring out what the impacts of that is that that mm -hmm. are and it probably differs from person to person some of us like seeing our, <laughs> our picture up there all the time uh, but uh i i think we have to take stock and and decide you know is this impacting me in a positive or negative way something i've done i've tried to do is i with zoom for some reason i go the full hour and then another person comes on and then i go a full hour and another person comes on and you know, if I was seeing people in person as a counselor, you always have 10 minutes in between and you make sure. But for some mm -hmm. reason with Zoom, I fell into the habit of like rapid fire from one to the next, to the next, to the next. And I think that is exhausting and draining. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's definitely something w we want to personally think about and monitor. And there is yeah. research on this Zoom fatigue. I tend to think Zoom is one of the great things that ever happened for me. <laughs> I, yeah. I communicate with people on Zoom more than mm -hmm. I did before, and I feel more connected. The funny thing is I'm more of an introvert, and it's in this last year and a half I've been doing a lot of community psychology research. And if I had to get dressed up, find where it was, go <laughs> over there, it would be. But it's been so easy for me to reach out and to try new things on Zoom, which is, mm -hmm. I think, peculiar. And it probably reflects my personality, but it just shows how what we've been forced to do, in some ways, it, it can be a benefit, in some ways, a cost. It depends on who we are, what our work is. Mm -hmm. But we always want to stop and, you know, examine what, how is it affecting my everyday life? Right. Well, it's interesting you brought up the notion of back-to-back -back meetings, because I know that's something that I've sort of noticed. And working at McGill, you know, we're on a sprawling campus. You know, in the old days, back-to-back -back meetings still meant you had 10 to 15 minutes yes. between meetings to get from one building yes. to the other or across campus. And I found those, much like you described the commute, very therapeutic in some way, yeah. or just a, a chance to sort of shut your brain down, whereas now it's literally sometimes every hour on the hour, a meeting ends, next one starts, meeting ends. Exactly. Starts, so it's quite draining. Professor Cohen, you had your hand up. You wanted to jump in on that? Uh, just to remark that 
I have no never been as tired as I have been after teaching a Zoom session. Oh my! Who knew that that standing in stu- in front of a camera because I do stand could be so exhausting? I also noticed that that the um, effects of Zoom on teaching quality was highly variable. I think yes. it made me a much better teacher, much like Richard. I'm not sure that's that's true no. for for well, all of my colleagues. Mm-hmm. I actually got the lowest ratings I've ever gotten <laughs> last year. Now, I'm not sure if it was from the actual lecture content. I also decided because I wasn't seeing the students in person that I needed more face to face. So I would meet with a group of them every week for an hour. And a lot of what they did was complain to me. And I just couldn't take it after a while. So I think I came across as a much more uh, disagreeable person than I would ordinarily when I'm in front of a larger class. Well, uh, you both have, have, have acquitted yourself very well during our conversation <laughs> today, but but it's an interesting point. I wonder, do you find that people are maybe more open and sort of, you know, with their complaints, with their concerns, oh, when they're yes. not in an in-person, face-to-face <laughs> environment? Yes. As professors, we knew that already with email. It's unbelievable the red hot emails <laughs> that students will send off. Uh, and I always have to tell myself, don't respond right away. Don't respond right away. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> but right. I, I do think there's some of this with, with Zoom where there's more disinhibition. Mm-hmm. And I think there's just the students have been suffering so much that they're really coming from a wounded place mm-hmm. and, you know, that the alumni who are listening, I'm sure you have young people who've been at home for the last <laughs> year and it's been tough on them. Uh, there's, mm. If you're a young adult, there's so many things you want to be doing and to not be able to see friends and do activities, oh, it can drive you crazy. Absolutely. So Professor Cohen, the one thing I do want to ask you about, maybe a bit light, more lighthearted, but since I have your attention, you've obviously <laughs> studied a lot of you know corporate co- Uh, Derek, you have frozen for me. Yeah, same Press with me. Pose. You know, so many of us have a uh, more normal or more routine way that we're going to see a relaxing of office dress codes. I, I'm not suggesting, you know, pajama Fridays. Um, but will the days of suits and ties be replaced by a more casual approach to dress? I tend to think those are gone. Those are way behind <laughs> us. There aren't wow. that many industries left where where people put on suits and ties. I have to go to a photo shoot after this and for a headshot. And I'm thinking, do I have to wear a jacket? And, yeah. and I've decided I don't. Um, you know, corporate lawyers don't have to wear suits except when they are seeing clients. So there's, there's that general relaxation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Professor Kessner? Yeah, I have a story about that because my my office moved from the Stewart Biology Building to 2001 uh, McGill. It's a, it's a high rise. It's a beautiful building. The, the premier has, uh, has, has an office in there. And I thought, oh, no, now I'm going to have to get dressed up because there's a lot of professionals, the, the government, the ministers are in there. And for the first couple of weeks, I dressed up and in the elevator, I fit in perfectly. But then I noticed there were some guys getting in the elevator who dressed like I usually dress. They were the tech people who were coming to fix things. Mm -hmm. So then I started dressing like one of the tech people (laughs) and I fit in just fine. And I Mm -hmm. think I think this this pandemic is going to take it to another level that I've always wanted to be more casual. And I have a feeling that I could even go in and teach in shorts uh, when I when I return to teaching in person, and it will be mm-hmm. more acceptable than it has been. Yeah. Well, I guess professors are a different breed. I remember early in my time at <laughs> McGill, it was in the summer. I probably my first summer at McGill, putting on a suit in the middle of July because I had a meeting with a department chair who will remain unnamed. Yeah. <laughs> um, and going to his office, and he was there greeting me in a t-shirt, shorts, and sandals. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> no. And I was the uncomfortable one. Yeah. Um, That's why we become professors. Yeah. It's that kind of freedom. <laughs> Oh, that one. <laughs> That's the reason to be a professor. Right. I know I have friends who say I'd never be willing to be a dean because I would have to wear a suit again. Yeah, hmm. very interesting. <laughs> um, and of course, we're going to record this for posterity. So uh, we did get one question that's just come in. I guess for you, Professor Cohen. I know you actually addressed this early in in the in your remarks. Perhaps this listener wasn't listening, or I'll, I'll ask it anyway. Uh, it comes from Nancy Lee. 
Um, so she's asking whether companies should be allowed to pay employees less if they choose to relocate to a less expensive city and work remotely from there. They're still performing the same function, but from a different location. Uh, I would argue that, that that's a very bad idea because the, the choice about where to locate um, isn't always within a person's control. If they are doing the same work and they have the choice about where to live, why should you pay someone more? Because they choose to live in London, which is very expensive. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And and uh, I think what I said earlier was I think this is actually something of a regressive tax or it would yeah. be a regressive tax. Those who are wealthy and can afford to live in expensive places would be paid more. Those outside would be paid less and yeah, it would just right. escalate mm -hmm. the degree of inequality. So right. I yeah. am dead set against this kind of policy. Right, right. Okay. Well, listen, we only have a couple of minutes left uh, before we have to wrap up. So let me just end with one final question to each of you. And I'll ask you to, to keep it brief if you can. Uh, Professor Cohen, um, I know the next few months are going to be one of transition and uncertainty across many work settings. And of course, with the this fourth wave of the, the, the virus, who knows you know, when we're going to return to a new normal. Um, but if you could peer into your long-term crystal ball, how differently do you expect office work to look like, say, 10 years from now compared to what we had experienced as, as late as 2019? Oh, my crystal ball, it's broken. Um, <laughs> I, 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 you know, work is constantly evolving and, and I don't think I really can make a, any sort of prediction about what it's going to look like, how much of it's going to happen, where we're going to do it, who's going to, who we're doing it with. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to, uh, avoid the question. Fair enough. We might have you back in a few years to reflect back <laughs> what the transpires. on my non-prediction. <laughs> there you go. And Professor Kessner, um, other than, um, you know, buying a good pair of maybe Bermuda shorts, I was wondering if you had any... <laughs> I bought a pair yesterday, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering if you had any final tips for, for those of us who are about to jump back into the office yeah. and back into commuting um, in the yeah. coming weeks. Any, any final thoughts that we yeah. should be thinking about? Please, please take it easy on yourself in terms of self-criticism and expectations. And I wouldn't even set that many goals. I know as a university person, I, I have all these things I want to do in the first semester. And if it's possible, I think we should focus on just having a good reinsertion into work and just make sure you feel like, boy, I, I'm making choices. I'm doing the things I want. I'm crafting my job. I'm connecting with the people I care about. And, uh, I'm growing and I'm learning. And I think this is going to definitely be a, a mastery <laughs> learning <laughs> kind of year mm -hmm. for us. We, we're going to have to get into the groove again. And we shouldn't think that we're going to be top performers right away. It's, it's okay. Be forgiving of yourself and others. Great. Well, wonderful. Great advice. Thank you so much. So yeah. that does about wrap up the time we do have today. Before we close, I'd like to remind everyone watching that this video will be available at this very same link soon after a recording ends. So feel free to share it with others who may not have missed, uh, uh, who may have missed the opportunity to tune in live. And of course, of course, like to extend my deepest gratitude to our two guests today, professors Lisa Cohen and Richard Kessner, uh, for joining me and sharing such great insight and some, some great stories as well on, on the very complicated aspects of work and mental well-being in the post-pandemic world. Please be sure to join us again in just under two weeks' time on Tuesday, August 31st, when I'll be joined by professors from McGill's Departments of Economics and Finance to look at how the pandemic has impacted our economy and our drive for personal wealth and financial stability. And two weeks afterwards, we'll conclude this series with a conversation about the future of our cities, which have, of course, been greatly impacted by the pandemic. Until then, I wish everyone a safe rest of the summer. Be well and signing off from my work office. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you.